one thing about packaging is that no matter how stunning it is, if your product isn't sold anywhere, it really doesn't matter what it looks like. So how do you convince retailers to pick up your product and put it on shelves? I personally have been on the brand side and the retailer side before joining uh, Project Nosh and BevNet, and I know how hard it is to connect with a buyer. So to help with that, we've got uh, Bill Sipper, who is the managing partner at Cascadia Managing Brands. Before founding Cascadia, Bill worked with brands including Nantucket Nectars, Fresh Samantha, and New Leaf Brands. So please welcome Bill. Thank you. Good morning, how is everybody? It's good. Thank you for having me, I appreciate it. I'm gonna try and talk as quickly as I can so we can get through all these slides. Don't worry, you get a printout at the end. You, my number and name are on the, the presentation, so don't hesitate to call if you have any questions or you didn't understand something or you want more clarification. We don't charge for, for stuff like that. So, who is Cascadia Managing Brands? We are an outsourced uh, opportunity for food and beverage companies. We do general consulting, we do sales management, we do everything from making key account calls with our employees to managing other people's sales forces. We do marketing, we also manage marketing people in the office that are employed by the uh, manufacturer. Uh, we do customer service, logistics, and accounting, any back end that you need. We're just an outsource of an office for entrepreneurial companies. We work with startups and we work with multi billion dollar companies alike. Okay, these are just some of the brands that we've worked with. I started my career at Avion. I was VP of marketing at Naked Juice. Um, we've been in the beverage industry too many years to count. It's been a long time. Um, what you're going to uh, run into when you, when you start dealing with buyers is that there, there's a big problem with the amount of time that you have, or they have, I should say. Um, there are thousands and thousands of SKUs that are authorized and unauthorized every year, and a buyer can only do so much, and they're really understaffed. So time is a big problem for them. Shelf space is also a big problem for them, because every time they take a product and put it on the shelf, that means something has to come off the shelf. And you have to prove to them why your product is a better product than what just came off the shelf. Um, and the third is, is share of their mind. And I say share of mind, again, it goes back to the time. They just have so many things to do in so little time. So let's talk about some of the hurdles. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but you should keep this uh, for later. These are the margins that each channel traditionally will work with. So DSD is the DSD distributor, direct store door distributor. They work on about 30 to 33% margin. We're starting to see some 35s in there. Um, a grocery chain will normally work on uh, 33 to 35. Your specialty chains will work on 40 to 44 percent. And, uh, you know, you've got Whole Foods and, and the fresh market, which are even a bit higher. Uh, grocery and produce departments work on 45 to 55 percent. Natural foods distributors will work on 25 to 35 percent with the exception of their key accounts like Whole Foods, for example, that they work on a markup program where they only charge 6 percent or 8 percent. Um, C store traditionally works on 40 to 50 percent margin. Drug channel 40 to 50 percent, 45 to 50 percent, and club about 11 to 13 percent. Um, what are you going to need when you go into this meeting with the buyer? And everyone, you know, freaks out the first time they go into a buyer. They don't know what they should present and how they should present it. Well, guess what? Everybody's been in this in the same seat that you're in right now, and the buyer knows that. Okay, and most buyers will be helpful if you don't waste their time. Um, so you need a spec sheet. That's height, weight, you know, size of your case, UPC codes, uh, price to his store or her store, suggested retail price, all that stuff. And if anyone needs a sample um, spec sheet, just email me and I'll send you uh, just something that we use. Um, you need to have a unique selling proposition. What makes you unique? What makes you different? What makes you interesting to the buyer and to that retailer and, and to the consumer that's going to buy in those stores? What's your branding? What's your positioning? What's your messaging? You can get, actually get this on one slide. You do have to identify your competition, but be really careful not to knock them. You have to know your competition for two reasons. One, you need to take advantage of their weaknesses, whatever they may be, uh, to get your product on the shelf and their product off the shelf. And two, um, you need to know who your target is, you know, and, and it's really important. A lot of people walk in and they go, 
I want to be on your shelves. And the buyer will say, well, where do you want to be? And they go, I don't know. And there's dead silence. Tell them where you want to be. You want the eye level shelf. So what's on the eye level shelf that you can replace? Um, what's your brand? So we, what problem does your brand solve for the consumer or for the retailer? And at the end of the day, every bullet point that we talk about comes down to one thing. What's in it for the retailer? Because all they care about is how much money they can make from your product. They want to charge you slotting. That's an entry fee. They want you to, to make margin off your product, and they want to sell volume of your product. So you have to fit some of those needs if you want to be successful. The hardest part, in my opinion, is always finding the right buyer. Um, how do you reach them? How do you find out? If you call up Albertsons today and uh, dial zero, for example, and, and try and get a human being to try and find out who the grocery manager is or the, the grocery buyer is, forget about it. Um, but you can find out by asking friends, you can ask colleagues, you can actually ask competitors. Most people will share that information, um, consultants. But also don't be afraid to use tools like LinkedIn and Facebook. I wouldn't necessarily direct message a buyer on Facebook. It's a little personal. But I do think it's okay to do a, your research to find out who the buyer is. Um, and LinkedIn's a great way to, to get people's attention because they get thousands of phone calls a day, they get thousands of emails. Every once in a while, something that's a little bit unique, like a LinkedIn email or whatever, it, it helps you break that breakthrough. You've got to be a gorilla. Try and get to a switchboard. Ask for the accounting department if you have to, OK? You'll get a human being in accounting. Everyone wants to get their bills paid, right? So go to the accounting department. Ask them who the grocery buyer is. They're only happy to get you off the line and give you that information and move on. Um, don't procrastinate. Just make the call. We can sit about the theories of selling, and we can talk about what you should do and what you shouldn't do. Well, the first thing you've got to do is make the call. Make the phone call, send the email, and be relentless. Stay on top of them um, until they get back to you. At the same time, you don't want to piss them off. Um, what are you selling? Can you give me a speech in 30 seconds as if you were in an elevator and we were together in an elevator? Can you tell me what your brand is in 30 seconds or less? How many people could do that right now? How many people think you could do it after you had a little practice? Okay. So you've got to practice it, all right? Um, again, I go back to what's that unique selling proposition because that's going to be the most important fact, one of the most important factors to the buyer. How much are you willing to spend to get into the store, to promote your products, to give discounts, to pay for end displays? Um, they're a, a human cash register, those, these buyers, and they want to make money for their stores. And slotting and selling ad space and all that stuff, it's part of their job. Um, the more data you have and the more proof that you can provide, the easier your sell sales pitch will be to the buyer. But again, most people don't have that information. Um, don't think you need some specialized fancy report that costs $6,000 to quote from. Google it. You know, are organic honey sales up? you'll get the answers, okay? Um, and then obviously you're going to present in a PowerPoint or PDF or Keynote or something like that. Um, you've got to be ready to say no. Because one bad, one bad account will ruin you. My father had a, a, a really early, in the 70s, had a natural soda uh, called uh, Nice and Natural. And they were, they were doing really well. And he sold to ShopRite, which is a chain in New York, New Jersey. And he said, you know, we're going to give them a buy one, get one free to get in. And then they ordered like 25 containers. And he went, I just lost money on 25 containers, and I can't even produce this much. So you've got to be prepared to say no, OK? What can you actually afford? What can you leverage? If your product is incredibly unique, you have a lot of, lot of room to, you know, to leverage. Um, if you're a Me Too product, it's about what you're giving that buyer that's going to make it attractive. Um, you have to ask yourself, is this a good deal for you, or is it a bad deal from you, for you? You have to understand the economics of projecting out the volume and projecting out how much you're going to make or how much you're going to lose or how much you're going to spend on every case. It's incredibly important. And the only reasons that I can think of for making a bad deal would be either A, exposure. So if I could get into Starbucks and I had to lose money to get in, would I do it? Yeah, I probably would, okay? Um, or 
you need some credibility, so you want to leverage the chain's credibility. You are, for most of you, you're not in a big chain or in a big account yet, so you're going to have to pay your dues a little bit so that you can say, hey, I'm sold at Demoulas or I'm sold at this account, so the other accounts get more interested. Follow-up. 48% uh, of salespeople never follow up with a prospect. It's an amazing number. 48%. Ask the buyer when and how they want you to follow up. You're on their time schedule. And listen to what they tell you. Listen to any feedback they give you, any comments they make. Um, but no matter what, whether it was a good meeting or a bad meeting, you have to follow up. Which channels should your brand be in? So people think that brands get built in a supermarket. And I've yet to find a, a beverage outside of Pepsi and, Cola, Pepsi and, and Coke brands that build themselves out of a grocery store chain. Traditionally, the, the independent stores are the first ones to take on new products, followed by natural and gourmet sh stores, um, then followed by grocery, then convenience chains. Um, from there, it's pretty much club, drug, mass. Um, and everybody wants to go for the big hit. Everyone wants to go for Stop and Shop. Well, if Stop and Shop charges you two cases free, per store, per SKU, and you multiply that by the number of stores they have, it's a really good chance that most people in the room are going to be out of money. Okay? So you have to figure out where your brand plays the best. Where is it the strongest? What channel and, and at what price point and which promo promotions work right and which promotions don't work? Um, there are some buyers that will take a product on immediately. Uh, Whole, Whole Foods right now is on a very tight category review schedule. They told one of our clients at a trade show recently, I want your product. And I want, want your product at the show went from I want your product to call me in, you know, October when we review the category again. So some people are going to stick with category reviews. Um, every six months in most channels, there's a category refresh. So, you know, instead of authorizing 200 new SKUs, they may authorize 10 to 30. Um, but you do have a chance with that. And then there's, you know, people that you're going to just give, long, you know, it's a long-term conversation. You know you're, you're not going to close the Starbucks deal on the first call, right? Um, I think I just covered that, actually. How come they're not obvious when I write these slides? Um, developing your strategy for concentric circles. You really want to work from, your, from where you are, where you live, where your headquarters is, out, okay? And keep it close at first. If you are from Massachusetts, you need to, you need to make a, a dent in Massachusetts before you decide you want to go on to Florida and go into Publix or go into Circle K. Um, if all of your people, and if all of your people is just you, that's fine too, because a lot of companies have started that way. Um, if, if all your people are in Boston, launch in Boston. If all your people are in New York, launch in New York. Um, but don't try and launch cross-country. We tell clients, there's two things. All the business and beverage is on the East Coast and the West Coast, and, and snacks for that matter. All the volume is East Coast and West Coast. I like the Midwest. It's a great place to go, but there's not a lot of volume there. So if you're starting out and you have limited funds, start on the East Coast, then move to the West Coast, and worry about the middle later. So you, every time you go into a chain or to a buyer, you need to know your target. You need to know what margin they're looking for. So that earlier slide may be helpful. Um, what are their trade spend requirements? And it's okay to ask. What do you require? You know, what do you want me to do from a promotional perspective, from a, a brand building perspective? Do you want me to do in-store demos? But find all of that out up front. Um, what distributors do, uh, what, what distributors do they work with? And this is a really hard one for small companies because you may say that I've got Polar as my exclusive distributor and the supermarket chain or may say, well, we don't use them. We want you to go through DBI. And you're going, who? You know, it's a problem. So you have to know who their distributors are before you go take that meeting. And you also know what margins the distributors work on because there are different types of distributors. You have natural food distributors, you have DSD distributors, um, there's one other, uh, wholesa wholesalers that, you know, charge less margin than a DSD distributor. So you need to know that up front. Again, what do you need to prepare? Sell sheet, spec sheet, pitch deck, a brand overview. Um, what are your products and, and the attributes of your products? 
understand your positioning and messaging and how it's important to them. What are the costs and margins for the brand, for the retailer, and for the distributor? Um, promotional calendar. How often do you plan to promote and at what level? What margins do their distributors work with? Uh, where do you want the, your product merchandise? This should all be in your deck. You also need to have the suggested retail price, the suggested promotional price. And throughout this process, from the beginning to, end, to the end, please look at this as an educational process. In this industry, a no is never a no. A no just means not now. Because you'll, you'll make these calls three years in a row, and eventually they'll take it, if it's a good product. And all that feedback that you get in those three years, it's invaluable. Anything they say about packaging, write it down. Anything they say about your pricing strategy and promotional strategy, write it down. You may not be able to act on it immediately, but at least you know what, what they're thinking. And, you know, to a certain extent, you have to be, uh, you're the brand owner, and you have to keep the image of the brand that you want kept, right? When I worked for Nantucket Nectars, we got into BJ's up here. This is a true story. And uh, I was so excited. I was high-fiving everybody in the office. He was really excited. We're a small company. And uh, I went to Tom first, the owner, and I said, but they want white boxes. <coughs> and he said, uh, I'm not doing white boxes. I said, what do you mean you're not doing white boxes? Could you tell me this before I went, made the call? They want white boxes. He said, we're not doing white boxes. It's bad for the environment. It's acid washed. We're not doing it. I had to call the buyer back and go, um, we're not going to be in your stores. And we didn't until she accepted a traditional tray. Um, embarrassing, but I should have known that going in, not coming out. So you've got to stick with what you believe is right and what the right principles are for your brand, even though people are giving you feedback that may be a little bit different than, than your target. Um, following up, ask when to follow up. Don't be shy, but don't be annoying. I have, in my career, been on the annoying side of buyers, and it's not the best position to be in. And uh, thank you. So I think we have some time for questions. So I guess, you know, the first question I have is you said don't be annoying, you know, be careful, but sometimes it's really hard to get a buyer. How do you know when you're crossing that line between, like, giving them the nudge they need and, and crossing into annoying? It's, it's really hard. I mean, um, I think I'd rather ask for forgiveness than permission. You know, I'd rather over-contact them and look like I'm really interested in their business than, you know, wait too long. So I think, you know, some buyers we contact every day because we know they're going to be a pain and they're going to get back to us on the 14th email. You know, others we do once a quarter because they don't want to be emailed. So it really depends on the buyer, but you'll find out pretty quickly if you start the follow-up process. Hi. Do you suggest making sales calls with your distributor or going it alone and then bringing them on board afterwards? That's a good question, too. Um, you know, I think it, it also depends. Unfortunately, this is, a black, this is not a black and white business, and there's just absolutely no right answers. They can be, everything can be attacked from multiple angles. But um, if you know that that distributor, A, is authorized in those stores, B, has a good relationship in those stores, and C, can cover the whole chain, then definitely, okay? But if they can only service 20 out of the 35 stores, it's problematic. Okay. Or if they're not an authorized vendor, it's basically going to keep you out of that chain unless you're a little open-minded to what the, the uh, retailer wants. All right. I think we have time for one more. Hi. Looking at all of the uh, margins that distributors and retailers charge, there's a damn big incentive for me to sell directly to consumers. Obviously, there's a customer acquisition cost. Sure. But the question is, are there any uh, instances where a retailer will say, we will not work with you if you also sell directly to consumers? Absolutely. <laughs> so what you have to do is make sure that your price at the online, let's call it, or direct to consumer is higher than it would be in a grocery store or in a chain, okay? And what, the way you can remedy that is by having a higher list price and then dealing promotions off of that. That'll keep you somewhat protected. Um, we had a, a client that we sold the product to uh, Walmart and Whole Foods threw the top two SKUs out. That was our punishment. 
Okay. It looks like we have time actually for one more, and then we'll move on. Could you um, ballpark the trade spend that we should anticipate? Expectations? <laughs> well, I would say that most companies, most retailers are looking for the equivalent in a check of one free case per SKU per store. Okay? Um, Stop and Shop, for example, looks for two cases per store. Some of the convenience store chains will ask you just for a monetary number, $175 a shelf, $200 a shelf. Um, but it really depends which channel you want to be in and how many stores you, you want to be in. It's really a, it's a tough number to decide. Um, but, you know, understand that it's all about that slotting fee up front, unfortunately. And it's all about the, promotional, the promotion. So I think you've got to work a little bit backwards. Figure out what promotions work for the consumer and then figure out if, you know, what I mean work for the consumer, meaning that actually sparks interest by the consumer. And see first if you can afford that. If you can't afford it, then you're going to do what everyone else does. Instead of being five for five, you're going to go to four for five or three for five. Um, but, you know, the most optimal way is obviously a strong spike. So I think we, we have to move on now, but I'm sure you'll be around for questions yeah. a little longer. And on the topic of trade spend, I know we have another great presentation coming up soon.